So if we get a very low rate of growth, like 3% per annum on our asset, it can take two decades before it goes on to double. Now, I don't know about you, I don't like the sounds of that. So when I go out and shop for real estate, I want to choose real estate which has with it a decent rate of growth of 5% and above. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, code cracking stuff. I have to say, this is a real code cracker. I don't know if this is going to make a good podcast because we're going to dig into one of my Excel spreadsheets. Does that sound fun? All the, uh, all the bookworms are like excited right now. We're getting into the data, the nitty gritty. Uh, everyone else is appalled. Why would we be going into a spreadsheet? Going to dig into my rule of 10 spreadsheet. Yes. What is my rule of 10 spreadsheet? Well, you're going to have to wait until I do my introduction before I explain what the rule of 10 spreadsheet is, because it could be the spreadsheet that answers the ultimate question in real estate. Does that sound riveting? Well, I hope so. Welcome back, regulars. Play the program in double speed. Get your life back. All the episodes I've done are lessons on real estate. So if it's your first time tuning in, wow, you've come to the right property podcast. Today, though, we're going to dig into a subsection of my 4X growth plan. And you guys know my 4X growth plan. I tend to mention it a lot. Uh, we can make money from the deal. We can make money from the marketplace, the cycle itself. We can make money from having a property that stands out from the crowd. And of course, we can uh, add value to real estate and choose a great location when it comes to property investment. But property investment is ultimately a game of leverage and time. You're basically putting those two equations against each other. You're going to leverage a deposit that's going to allow you to purchase a property. That property uh, could be $500,000, $600,000, million. And you're going to allow a defined duration point of time to provide a return to you. And that return comes in both the form of capital growth and also rental growth. Today, though, I wanted to dig into my rule of 10 when it comes to understanding what type of rate of growth you can expect from what type of property. Now, the rate of growth is one of the most important factors of real estate. The rate of growth is really the compounding growth rate of which a property grows at. By way of example, loose maths, if you had a rate of growth of 10% per annum, your property could actually in fact double in seven years. If you have a rate of growth of 7% per annum, which is considered very, very good, your real estate can double in 10 years. If you were to look at the average rate of growth in the marketplace, according to Core Logic, over a 30-year period as measured, the real estate market and its rate of growth around Australia is around 5.4%. That's not including the yield as a total return. So at 5.4%, you're roughly seeing real estate double in around 14 years. And of course, anything below that, the average is below average. And of course, some properties still haven't doubled in value and uh, they've been owned for 20 plus years. So if we get a very low rate of growth, like 3% per annum on our asset, it can take two decades before it goes on to double. Now, I don't know about you, I don't like the sounds of that. So when I go out and shop for real estate, I want to choose real estate which has with it a decent rate of growth 
or 5% and above. Obviously, some property performs better than others because of the sheer nature of the asset and the sheer scarcity of the property. And of course, quite often, the best real estate is in very expensive marketplaces. And it's the best real estate. It's got the highest price tag and it gets the highest rate of growth because it's simply the best. So let's go through my rule of 10. Now, my rule of 10 is just the concept that I proportion 1% growth rate to 10 factors in real estate. And uh, I proportion the growth rate at 1% uh, for a good score, uh, half a percent for a medium score, 0% for a low score and minus 0.5% for a bad score. So in fact, a property can go backwards in growth if it's not the right type of asset. So I'm going to talk you through my rule of 10 spreadsheet. Yes, spreadsheet junkies, you might like this one. But I've got a scoring system out of 10. So the maximum you can score is 10 out of 10, which is a very rare property would actually ever score 10 out of 10. Um, 10 out of 10 means 10% capital growth and the real estate you pick would double in value in seven years. Now, of course, uh, you have to apply this real estate into a cycle and cycles have entry and exit points. They have points where you're halfway through a cycle. But the point of today's conversation is how can we determine the long-term rate of growth if we give the real estate a bit of time? How can we narrow down a good pick in real estate when picking a property? So uh, knowing that, we could also choose a really bad property and uh, we could, in fact, choose a property which grows negatively using my rule of 10. It could, in fact, grow negatively by 5% because it's such a train wreck of a property. And, of course, there are real examples of train wrecks of properties going backwards by 5%. In other words, people basically buy the wrong property and it goes down in value continuously over a period of time. Now, real estate has a defined duration period. A real estate cycle is deemed to be 18.2 years. Uh, I like to coach people just to expect real estate to double over a 15-year period, which is roughly about a 5% capital growth rate. If they're an uh, entry-level buyer shopping on a budget, because obviously you can get a higher capital growth rate if you have a unrestricted budget when it comes to investment. And I do believe today the highest capital growth rates in the marketplace tend to be starting with a million dollar price tag. It's just the way it is. Uh, Australian real estate is not cheap and some of the more impressive neighbourhoods carry a premium, particularly in our major urban areas. So don't be too disappointed if uh, you feel like you're scoring a medium level score. It's very common for property investors to get a 5 or 6 and sometimes a 7% capital growth rate on their asset. Obviously, if you've got an unrestricted budget, you should be going for those 7% plus capital growth rates. What we don't want is a low score. We don't want a 3% capital growth rate or a minus 1% capital growth rate when we're choosing a property. So my rule of 10 calculator basically allows me to do a quick synopsis on what to expect as a capital growth rate from the real estate being picked in the marketplace. Now, can I prove my rule of 10 calculator actually works? Well, 
I have put it up against certain properties that have performed historically, and I believe it works. However, it is not a crystal ball, so uh, don't, you know, don't, I don't know. It's not a crystal ball. That's all I can say. Uh, but if we go to the factors which I consider when um, I go through the rule of 10. So the first thing I consider is the city slash settlement. This is the first uh, component. Now, remember the maximum score from city settlement is 1%. Now, if I was in a major top 10 city in Australia, I would score 1%. Because obviously, Australia is a big country, but it has very few places people actually live. So if you can live in a or invest in a top 10 city of population density, you're going to get 1%. If your city is below that, it's a city between 10 and 30, like the top uh, 11 to 30 cities, you're going to score half a percent. This is your adding to your overall capital growth rate. If you're in a small town, which doesn't make the top 30, you're going to get zero capital growth from city settlement. And if you're in a town of less than 10,000, you're actually in my calculator, going to go backwards by half a percent. So let's assume we are buying a property in Brisbane today. We're going to put that into my rule of 10 calculator. It's going to give us a capital growth rate for the city settlement as 1%. The next factor I'm going to look at in my calculator, which is ridiculously difficult to demonstrate on a podcast uh, perhaps I should do a webinar, is suburb, location, and surrounds. Now, if the suburb is well-established and nice, it's just a nice place, it's going to score um, 1%. Now, the problem with the calculator is interpretations because I use my own interpretation Um and you might have your interpretation of what is nice. But I think we can all agree there are nice places. They're usually quite leafy. They've got beaches. They've got great cafes. You know the drill, great schools. They're quite affluent. Um, they're nice. They're nice places. They're not high crime, horrible places. So if uh, in the second section, suburb, location, and surrounds, you, you've got nice, you get 1%. If you've got midpoint, the average, an average suburb, it's, it's good, it's not great, then you're going to score half a percent. If your suburb's a bit of a dump, uh, you're going to score zero. You're not going to get any capital growth on my calculator. And if your suburb is actually like really bad, like the worst in the city, um, and it's considered very, very poor appeal as a suburb, you're going to score yourself minus 0.5%. So let's just play the game here. Uh, I'm in Brisbane. Um, I'm getting 1% for my capital growth rate for investing in that settlement. Now I'm going to choose a mid-range property because I want to invest around the median of $800,000. I can't afford a really, really nice gun suburb, but I'm going to choose an average suburb, not a below average suburb. And so now the calculator has my capital growth rate at 1.5%. This is the score is building. So then we're going to go from settlement to suburb to street. Yes, the street. Can the street add a percent to our capital growth rate? Remember, it's a lot of the local factors that determine the rate of growth, what you uh, do at a, at a localized level. A localized level in the concept of I'm choosing Brisbane, a suburb, a street. 
So let's consider an average suburb where, and now let's go to the streets in that average suburb. Every suburb has a nice street presence, streetscape, a midpoint um, street, a below average street, and a run down, never own real estate street. So let's, uh, let's, if you've got a really nice street presence, you drive down the street and there's old leafy trees and, and it's wide and it's beautiful, you're going to score 1%. If it's just an average street, it's not a bad street, it's not a good street, it's just really, really t- typical of Australia, then you're going to score half a percent. If your street is below average and maybe it's a little bit too much traffic on that street, um, then you're going to score zero. And let's examine that. Let's say it's a really bad street, like a highway or something. You're going to actually lose a point. You're going to lose half a point. So for today's demonstration, I am going to choose a a midpoint street. And I have now added half a percent to the overall capital growth forecast for this dwelling. So I am now at 2%. I've got a long way to go to, uh, to make up some ground when it comes to making sure the real estate is the right real estate to buy. So we've done settlement, we've done suburb, we've done street. Now we're going to do the land or the soil to have another S. And uh, when we're analysing the land, we can use some concepts. The first and second concept is land to asset ratio or land to free space ratio. Now, a land to asset ratio is just basically a dwelling has good land value that will grow in value and um, the large proportion of the dwelling is basically um, uh, land content. And uh, so if you can imagine... The land to asset ratio, if you were buying a property for a million dollars and the actual structure, the house, was worth $500,000 and the land itself was worth $500,000, you've got a 50% land to asset ratio. The land to free space ratio is a ratio commonly used when assessing um apartments, and also townhomes. Apartments obviously don't have as much land as a house. And so when you're buying an apartment, you look at what free communal space is part of the apartment. Maybe it's got a really awesome roof deck, which you get, or maybe the apartment's across the road from a park. It's completely free space. So people in the apartment ultimately have a backyard where they can walk their dog. They've got a lot of open public free space. So uh, we can have one point for good land to asset or free space ratio. You can get a 0.5% point for a midpoint land to asset ratio or free space ratio. So 50% being 50% land, 50% build would be considered a midpoint ratio. Below average would be basically the building and its uh, value is is basically um, not um, providing much ca- capital growth because there is no land value. And unproductive land to asset ratio is is really basically the land is worthless so they're the how i scale and rank the position so let's now choose um again a midpoint land to asset ratio let's for example say we're buying um a basically 50 percent 
land to asset ratio dwelling um, and score ourselves another half a percent. So obviously, if we were um, doing something which had with it a higher land to asset ratio, say 70%, we would get a 1% score. The next scoring mechanism, and I hope you guys are still tuning in because this could be the boringest podcast ever done, is the building, the style and building. Now, let's score style and building. The highest score you can get is 1%, which is modern, functional, and architectural. The second highest score you can get is modern functional. The third is a zero score, a tired asset. And the negative score would be a decrepit asset that's going to need capital costs. So modern, functional, and architectural. Let's, for example, say you were buying a Art Deco apartment. It would score very highly as architectural. Uh, in the modern world, you can buy a lot of architectural masterpieces as well. So as long as there's some good architecture, you're going to score very, very highly from a capital growth perspective. If it's just a modern functional property, you um, won't score anything for that. Um, uh, sorry, if it's a modern functional asset, you will score well you'll get half a percent. And if it's a tired asset, you're going to score nothing. So let's uh, add a tired asset to the mix. It's a bit run down. It's going to need some money spent on it. Are we getting any capital growth on that? No, no one's going to pay you extra for a tired asset from a capital growth position. So all of a sudden now we get a, our first zero. We've chosen something that's a bit tired. How can we overcome that tired asset, well, maybe we have to go renovate the asset. Let's go to the next uh, section of the scoring mechanism, which is size, layout, and design. Now, let's uh, score this. You get 1% for generous and functional, half a percent for typical and functional, 0% for below average and irregular, and a minus score for dysfunctional size layout and design. So for this example, I'm going to actually score generous and functional. I found a generous size property with a big functional layout and I'm going to get a 1% capital growth rate for that. So then we go to number seven. Remember we've done one settlement, two suburb, three street, four, land, five, style and building, six, size, layout and design, and seven, we're now analyzing supply. Is supply fix, fixed or variable? So the highest score you can get is fixed and finite. This is typically those blue ribbon suburbs where you're never going to see even one apartment come to those suburbs. They're those very tightly held NIMBY suburbs and they score very, very highly. Uh, fixed and finite supply, yes, they would score 1% in this example. The next category is semi-fixed and will become finite. Um, that's a half a percent. The next is variable. The suburb constantly gets new supply and the worst you can get is oversupplied um, at a long-term level. An example of that would be Parramatta CBD. It's constantly oversupplied. It's going to go backwards constantly when it comes to its supply levels. Just when you think you don't have supply, more supply is added. So let's choose semi-fixed to become finite. And now we've got another 0.5% added to our scoreboard. So where are we at? Well, currently the asset we're analyzing is probable to return a 4% capital growth rate. Uh, 
we need to improve upon this. Um, can it be done? We've still got three factors which could actually get us a good capital growth rate. Remember, we want to get over 5% at a bare ass minimum. So let's go to the socioeconomic status and safety of the area. Is it a wealthy suburb? Do people or the large proportion of people earn the most amount in the suburb? If it's a wealthy suburb, it's going to score 1%. If it's above average wealth, it's going to score 0.5%. If it's below average, it's going to score zero. And if it's poor, it's going to lose 0.5%. I'm going to say this area is an above average area from an income distribution point of view. So I've now added 0.5% to my forecast for the rate of growth. The next section is stability. Uh, is it a proven marketplace? Is it a very stable marketplace? How do I analyze that? The first one, is it gentrified? Is it a very nice gentrified suburb? If it is, it's going to score 1%. Is it gentrifying? If so, it's going to score another 0.5%. Is it ungentrified? If so, it's going to score zero. Uh, and if it's never to be gentrified, if it's just an unloved place, it is unstable and it would lose 0.5%. So I'm going to say this property is gentrifying. It's not completely gentrified. My budget doesn't allow me to go into a completely gentrified area. And so I've got a five, uh, I've got a 0.5%. So we've done nine out of the 10. Now we're moving to the 10th. We've done settlement, suburb, street, land, building, size, supply, socioeconomics, stability. Uh, and now we're going to the final factor, which is systemized. Is the place infrastructure rich? Is it typical infrastructure is it outdated and lacking infrastructure or is it demodernized and never to receive infrastructure, uh, which is a real thing? So I'm going to say this area is infrastructure rich and that will score me one percentage point. Infrastructure rich is it's got schools, transport, roads, cafes. It's got a train line, a tram line, a ferry stop. It's infrastructure rich. It's got a choice of schools. It's got uh, things going for it. So now I've done my 10 for this property that I'm choosing in Brisbane. It's a midpoint suburb. It's a midpoint street. It's a midpoint land asset and free space ratio. It's a tied asset though. It's a generous uh, and functional size property. It's in a semi-fixed and finite, a semi-fixed but what will become a finite suburb. It's got above average incomes but not wealthy people. It's not gentrified but it is gentrifying and it is infrastructure rich. What is my factors of capital growth spit out? What does the spreadsheet reveal from this methodology? The rule of 10 Sagas methodology. The capital growth rate for that asset is 6%, which means the real estate will double in 12 years. I would expect to pay circa 650, 700 odd thousand to $750,000 for an asset like that. That's very, very typical of what investors might end up buying when it comes to um, if they do their research. Now, if I was to do the same example, and I've done this on some properties which I foolishly bought, I bought a property once in Moree. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Moree. There is nothing in Moree except hot 
artesian spring water of which old people basically dip in so their arthritis ultimately uh, goes away. And yes, it is a mecca for old people to feel young again. And I think there's old people sex happening in Moree. It is the geriatric sex capital of Australia. But other than that, there is nothing happening in Moree. Now, if I was to look at uh, an asset I bought a long time ago in Moree and I was to use the same concept, I would go to small town, basically less than 10,000 people. I score point, I minus 0.5%. I bought in a below average street. I score zero. I bought uh, in a below average uh, suburb within Moree. I get zero. I bought a property with below average land asset and free space ratio. I score zero. I bought a tired asset. I scored zero. Um, I bought a typical and functional floor plan or a below average and a regular floor plan. I bought a townhouse in Moree. Everyone lives in houses. It's a below average and irregular purchase. I bought um, in an area where there is variable supply. I mean, Moree is surrounded by cotton farms and you can ultimately build forever if you wanted to, if someone would actually ever build. So I'm going to say it's a very variable place. Uh, the socioeconomics of where I bought was below average and the stability or proven, is it gentrifying, is it gentrified, or is it ungentrified, or is it never to be gentrified? I'm going to say it's never to be gentrified. Is it infrastructure rich? No, uh, it is not infrastructure rich. Uh, it's really outdated. So uh, basically, when I look at the synopsis of that asset, I, it scores basically nothing. Nothing. There is no capital growth in that asset. And when I go back and I look at that asset, which I did offload, there was no capital growth in that asset. I bought it and held it for 15 years and made zero capital growth. So my rule of 10, if I had uh, known that before I bought that purchase, I wouldn't have applied buying that property. Now, obviously, everyone wants the top score buying a major city, a nice property, um, a above average street with nice presence, um, a formidable land to asset ratio, a modern functional architectural masterpiece, a generous and functional property, a property where there's a fixed and finite level of supply, a uh, only wealthy people live in that neighborhood. It's completely gentrified and uh, it's infrastructure rich. But the sad truth is most people can't afford that asset. If I was to describe that asset, that's a $1.5 million property right there in most places. And so don't be disheartened if you play the game and you get a score of five, five and a half, six percent. It's just a guide, um, but it's a good guide. I think it's a great guide. And really what you're trying to do is make sure you, at a bare ass minimum, score above five percent because you know you're picking some of the right characteristics of a property. All right, guys, that's it. That's spreadsheet rule of 10 explained. Um, and... Uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. I'm off and I'm going to do something else. Talk soon. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.